Well, I just, I'm just going to give thanks and thank you, Lord, for bringing us together and thank you, Jesus, for your promise. Where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, you're present with us. You're present in the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's on the basis of freedom that Messiah has liberated us. We stand firm this evening in that freedom. We're not going to be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We're governed, Father, by the law of the Spirit of your life. In the Messiah, we're freed from another sort of law that points out sin and requires death. That's because you, Jesus, died on behalf of all of us. And you resurrected on behalf of all of us. And you're the mediator of a new government, a new covenant. And it's of the spirit of your life. It's out from under a letter of the law that has a reward and system, a reward and punishment system that really causes human failure. But as Larry reminds us in the new covenant prophecy of Jeremiah 31, 31, this new covenant is that you give us the desires and the actions that please you. You inspire us to revere you so that as the prophet Jeremiah said, we'll never turn away from you. Lord, it's all a basis of grace which is your unconditional goodness that you have revealed to us in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray and offer up this service and thanking you for the celebration that's coming soon with Kelly and Kayla arriving. And we just give you thanks for Kelly acknowledging her birthday because, Lord, what a blessing to me that you've given me my wife Kelly and my daughter Kayla and my mom's granddaughter Kayla what a blessing to all of us that you've just given us these gifts in this life which is enriched by your presence so let your word your message live richly within us in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that we may be encouraged in heart this evening as we're knit together in love Thank you, Father God, for Vinny and Talik that are going to be coming as well. Let them, Father God, just continue to be encouraged along with us that you're at work in us, Father, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine so that you continue to get the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Bob did that one yes. time, and I just felt it. You got I that felt thing. it come right out, man. It was like that wasn't a word. That was power. Amen. I thank you all for coming because Genesis 1, 26 is on my heart. Why do I start with Genesis 1, 26 this evening? Because I'm remembering something that my dad said to me. My dad, I lost him a few years ago, but I'm going to get him back on the side of resurrection. Amen. And I thank God for, for that promise of life. And I thank God that Dad reminded me, he said, when you're talking about the theme of the redemption, the recovery of all creation, he said, your best argument is to start right there at the beginning of the Bible with creation. And this is what... I'm doing, taking Dad's advice here, starting with Genesis 1, beginning at verse 26. And, and I'm going to utilize a combination of the New International Version and a version from the 1800s called Young's Literal Translation. Because Robert Young in the 1800s in England, he did a translation where he attempted to be very literal on the Hebrew into the English. So I'm going to incorporate some of his translation along with the New International Version. And I'm just going to begin, and I'm going to share it at Genesis 1, starting at 26. But there's really three verses that I want to include right now. Genesis 1, 26 through verse 28. And, and, and sometimes I'm going to refer to the Hebrew name for God, because... In our English Bible, it shows up on the page as God. But the Hebrew name is Elohim. And so Elohim, interestingly, is a plural noun. 
so that it would literally be translated like capital G-O-D-S because it's in a plural form. And even though it's in a plural form, it is in what we call a singular verb, meaning like Elohim, he as one person created. So Elohim in the plural form, literally capital G-O-D-S, but when it comes to the verb, he created, it's just a single person that created. So Elohim is a plural form, but with a single verb, meaning he is one person created the heavens and the earth. So it's a mystery that you could get the idea of Elohim in this passage introduced to us even in the English translation. You know, let us create the human race. Let us do this action of creation. That's because of the plural form. But remember, it's a single verb. He is one person created. So the thought is that, that God is one spirit. And he expresses himself through the Father and the Son. It's just that there's one spirit. In other words, the Father, the Son are one spirit. And Elohim is one person, even though it's a plural form. So we can read, let us create the human race. We'll hear that in a minute. So I'm going to do Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And Elohim says, let us make Adam, the Hebrew for the human. Let us make Adam, the human as our image, as our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea. Let them rule over the birds of the air. Let them rule over the livestock. Rule over all the earth. And rule over all the creatures that move along the ground. So Elohim created Adam, the human, as his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created Adam, the human. Male and female, he created them. And Elohim blesses them and says to the male and the female, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and bring the earth under your control and let them rule over the fish of the sea and rule over the birds of the air and rule over every living creature that moves along the ground. There's a lot in this Genesis 1. It's verse 26, 27, 28. There's a lot here. So, I think I'm going to even say it one more time, just because there's so yeah, much really. in this, okay? And there's so much in this that the rest of the Bible is going to be developing. I mean, because this is the foundation of the rest of the Bible, because God's relationship to Adam, here in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, that is the relationship with all people. So whatever we're reading about in terms of God's relationship with Adam, the human, is also going to be his relationship with all people. Mm -hmm. And the purpose for the human is going to be the purpose for all people. And, and him filling the earth with the population of this one person that he sees, this one human that he sees as the ancestor, you know, an individual man named Adam and an individual woman named Eve, you know, the ancestors? Well, all of their descendants throughout every generation, throughout all of human history, they're all in the Hebrew Bible considered under the heading of that one family name, Adam, the human. The idea of the human family. Because that's why it can say in Genesis 1, 26, let us create Adam, and then it says, let them, meaning the family as a group. 
Adam as a group, as a family, let them rule over the fish, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, over all the earth, over the livestock. In other words, there's a unity to the name here. Because Adam is, is going to fill the earth and bring the earth under his control. But in Adam, we have a male and a female. In, in Adam, we have a human couple that produces a family and then they have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way through all the generations of history. God's point of view is that it's one human being. Adam, the human. Okay? So, I'll just say it one more time. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Elohim, that Hebrew name for God. Adam, the expression in Hebrew for the human which could be translated the human race here. And it's a timeless family identity because it's true for all generations, no matter who's born throughout history. So, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And Elohim says, let us make Adam the human as our image as our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and let them rule over the birds of the air and let them rule over the livestock and let them rule over all the earth and let them rule over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, God, as in Elohim, created Adam the human as his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And Elohim says to them and blesses them in what he says to them, be fruitful or fertile and multiply and populate the world and bring the world under your control and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and let them rule over every living creature that moves along the ground. So this is huge to me as a starting place for Bible study. Now we understand that before the human was even created on this sixth day of creation because when we start at Genesis 1.26 we're starting with the sixth day of creation. So, I skipped over the first five days of creation only to save some time. Because, you know, we could get into day one, the creation of the light. The, 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 the second day, the, the, the heavens are conceived of the open space, you know, but that, that we can call the sky, you know. the. Yeah, or, or the firmament. And, and, and then, you know, we get into, you know, the creation of the, the separation between the water and the dry land. And, and, and we get the creation of, you know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars. And then, and then the creation of the, the fish and the birds and the, and the land animals. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of the sixth day of creation that started with the land animals, all of a sudden the other part of the land creature is going to be special. In Genesis 1.26, why special? Because the human is, is now going to be as God's image or likeness. Amen. Now this is interesting, to me at least. Because when the Hebrew uses the terms image and likeness in other places in the Hebrew Bible, image and likeness are used of something that is a visual that's representing something else. It's often used as people, when they bow down to a statue and they're worshiping an idol, they're worshiping an image. It's the same Hebrew word here. It's something that's visual and it represents something else. Well, in this case, the human is created as that which is visible, namely, a human being, so that 
inside of that human being is the spirit, the invisible presence of God that he created us as a human to inhabit the living breath, the ruach in the Hebrew. You know, he breathed into the human his life-giving breath. He breathed into his nostrils, animating the human with, with the presence of God's Spirit in, living inside of the human being. That means that we're a living being because of God's living breath that he breathed into our nostrils. In other words, what I'm saying is that the human is special in God's creation because on the sixth day he created the land animals, but on the sixth day he created the special creature, the human. Because, because God's purpose is that all people, all the members of the human race, they project something that Jesus described as fruit. Now what do we mean when we say that God's spirit inside of our humanity would project something that Jesus called fruit. Jesus something used an illustration. Something for everybody. Yes, absolutely for everybody. And Jesus used this illustration. He said, he said, I'm the true vine. And when I was in Israel the last time, it was in 1982, there was a Palestinian family that lived right next to the location where we did a play and I was playing the role of a shepherd in Israel and I was herding real sheep. And, 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 and you know, the idea is that before we got to the location where we did this shepherd's play right outside of Bethlehem, the Palestinian family living next door, they invited me into their home and they had this, uh, you know, Arabian coffee and everything and it's really strong for me but I enjoyed the hospitality though. And, and I remember the family because, because they had a vine. They had a vine right on their property. And I, and I could picture through the vine that they had on their property that Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine. And then because of the way that I'm connected with you and you're connected with me, then we get a product from the vine. We get something that can be visible that's the product of the life that is coming from that original seed that planted that vine. We're getting this thing called fruit. And in the case of the vine, it would be grapes. And Jesus says, I am the true vine, the true source of what is going to create in you a connection with my living breath, with my spirit, that's going to cause you to project this thing called fruit, so that fruit, the Apostle Paul reminds us, is love. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And the fruit of the Spirit is patience. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. And and, and control, which interestingly in the Greek, it doesn't say the self-control that we get in our English Bible. It just has the word control. And, and to me, that means that God brings the control in our life. You know, because it's dependency upon the Spirit in the same way that Jesus says, I'm the true vine and, and you're like a branch that's on that vine. And by you living in me and my living in you, like his spirit living in and through us, and then, and then our mind is renewed by his spirit and refreshed by, by his thoughts, like he says, my words express spirit and life. Then what is the result? It's this thing that we call fruit. It's like God's love is projected from us. God's joy and peace is coming through us. And, and others are able to be around us and sense the, yes. the patience that Amen. God produces by His Spirit Amen. in us, the kindness, the goodness, yes. the, the gentleness, the, the control, the faith. Well, all of this is called fruit of the Spirit. It, it's, and, and what I'm wanting to do is to take the Genesis 1 about the purpose 
for which God created the human to project an image. That's good. Okay? Like that. that which is visible, or the other word paralleling image is likeness. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, the idea of a visible likeness. Remember when, when Jesus said in Luke chapter 20, I want you people to bring me a coin. And they brought him a coin and he said, whose picture or whose image or whose visible likeness is on this coin? And they said, Caesar, the Roman emperor. And the question had come up, well, does Jesus want to pay taxes to Caesar, the Roman emperor, and upset a bunch of Jewish people by doing that? Or is Jesus going to upset the Roman government by refusing to pay taxes to Caesar? So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to answer the people's question, do you pay taxes to Caesar or not, Jesus? He's going to say, bring me a coin. Whose image, whose visible likeness, whose picture is on this coin? Well, they say the Roman emperor's picture, the Caesar, his image is on the coin. And Jesus says, give to the owner of that coin the coin to pay taxes. Give to Caesar what belongs to him because it's his image, his picture on the coin. So give it to him. But give to God what belongs to God. Give him what belongs to him. Give to God what belongs to him. Are the image. So it's like Jesus, when he said, bring me a coin, it's like saying for our illustration tonight, bring me a human. Mm. Bring me a branch of the vine. Mm. You know, bring me a person that's animated by the living breath of God so that by means of the renewing spirit, then all of a sudden, where did this love come from? Amen. Where did this ability to love unconditionally yeah, come from? Right. Where is this joy in spite of all the things going on in my life that are frustrating Amen. or disappointing? Amen. Where is this peace come from? You know, peace that transcends all understanding. Yeah. Peace that guards our heart and our mind. Where does this come from? This patience, this, this goodness in spite of evil. Where does this faith come from in spite of well, how can we believe with the physical evidence that's to the contrary of everything good? It comes from the Spirit. And this is the animating presence of God that God created for the human race to project so that the human by the Spirit would project an image. There would be fruit, the love, the joy, the peace coming from the true vine. And it would be that which people could see. So that it reminds me of another verse. 1 John 4.12. Remember that one? 1 John 4.12? Even though we haven't yet seen God, because we love one another, it shows yes. that God lives yes. in us and His love is made complete among us. So, so this is what's happening. I'm excited tonight about the purpose of for the human, according to Genesis 1, 26-28, that God created the human to reflect God's image or His, His likeness. Meaning that, that God later on, after the creation on the sixth day of creation, right? God later on joined the human race in the person of Jesus and what image, what likeness, what form that is visible did God choose to take on? The human. God chose to enter the human race and be a member of Adam's family. We were made in His image. Because we were made to reflect His image and to reflect that which would be His character by having the Spirit of God, the presence of God, actually inside Amen. of our being, and that the human would be reflecting God's love, and, and God's joy, and God's peace, and God's patience. And people would be able to see a joyful person. 
You guys remember the time that I was on the way home from a Friday night Bible study, West North Lake, you know, in Palm Beach Gardens, and I go to the gas station at the corner of Military Trail and North Lake Boulevard, and I see on the other side of the gas station, Carlos, <laughs> who happens to be seeing a friend of his walk down the sidewalk, and he goes and greets him, and I kid everybody not, that I actually saw the radiance of God's light reflected from Carlos's face. I mean, it's like I had to pull over and call Chaz, who was also at the meeting earlier that night, but I pulled over and I said, Chaz, I just saw light radiating from, from Carlos's face from a distance. I saw that reflection. I saw that image. I saw that likeness. I saw that purpose for which the human was created on the sixth day. Because Carlos is sold out for Jesus. He is sold out for Jesus. And I know it personally. And you, and you personally know that that's true in your experience because of your relationship with him and vice versa. It is. It's guaranteed. And it is the love that the Spirit produces Amen. through this brother. Yes. And his family. Amen. His family which is here, praise God. Yes. And so I just want, yes. want, want everyone to know that, that, that as we remember this Genesis 1, 26, 20. Okay? Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. Elohim says, let us make the human as our image, as our likeness. And, yes. and let them, because it's a family identity, Adam, the human family, right? So, Genesis 1, 26. God Elohim says, let us create the human as our image, as our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and rule over the birds of the air and rule over the livestock and rule over all the earth and rule over every creature that moves along the ground. So Elohim created Adam the human as his own image. As the image of Elohim, he created him male and female. He created them. And Elohim says to them and blesses them when he says to them. So Genesis 1, 28, Elohim blesses them and speaks this to them. Be fruitful and multiply and populate the world. Fill the earth. Wow. That reminds me of Habakkuk 2.14. How could there be a connection between Habakkuk 2.14 and Genesis 1.28? Just remember Genesis 1.28. Elohim blesses the couple and says to them, be fruitful and fertile and, and multiply and fill the world, right, with people. Well, what does it say in Habakkuk 2.14? A prophecy of the future. Habakkuk 2.14 The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Yes. Like saying the image, the likeness. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as much as the ocean is full of water. Isaiah had the same vision in Isaiah 11 verse 9. Remember that one? Isaiah 11 verse 9. Same vision. The earth will be filled with the intimate knowledge of the Lord as much as the ocean is filled with water. In other words, in other words what, what I'm saying is that in Genesis 1.28, God's purpose for the human is going to be fulfilled. Amen. It's going to come true. The Lord's Prayer is famous for saying, may your kingdom come on earth. May your will be done on earth as it is done for you in heaven. In other words, that prayer is going to be answered because it's what God purposed on the sixth day of creation when He said, let us create the human as our image. This is going to happen for all of humanity. It's going to happen because Jesus went to the cross and died to cancel everybody's sin so that the resurrection on the third day is His token 
of faithfulness, his pledge of commitment to his original creation of the human race for a specific purpose to reflect the image, the likeness of God through the Spirit coming out of us, projecting the character of God through us. And the earth will be filled with the intimate knowledge of him. And the earth will be filled with the visibility of his glory. Remember when I saw the radiance from Carlos's face and I had to get off the road and call Chaz about it? It was, it was the light. And Jesus said it. Matthew 5.16. Remember that one? Matthew 5.16. Let your light so shine that people will see the good fruit. They'll see the love. They'll see the joy. They'll see the peace. They'll see the patience. Revelation 5.13. Oh, Revelation 5.13 is a good connection, Ron. Mm -hmm. Revelation 5.13. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Revelation 5.13. Every creature in heaven, every creature on earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea, every. everyone, all of it, all of them. Inside, outside. Hallelujah. They'll all be praising and honoring and giving glory to the Father and the Son, namely Elohim. They're all going to be praising Him, praising the one that sits on the throne, which, by the way, is called the throne of grace. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4.16 talks about let us approach the throne of grace with boldness to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of His glory. Why? Because it's going to be the Spirit that brings about what we preached about last Sunday, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Remember that one? 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory and are being changed into His likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So it's the Spirit that brings this transformation. In other yes. words, 2 Corinthians 3.18 uses the Greek word metamorphosis, literally to change in form. You know, it says that we all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory and are changed in form into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, the whole dynamic of how the human is going to reflect God's image and project the fruit of what Jesus refers to as the love, the joy, the peace, and the patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and the control of God in one's life, that all comes from the Spirit. And Jesus died on the cross to end the government of law that just simply gives people the demands of the covenant, which are good demands if they're able to be fulfilled, but the human nature is not capable of simply producing the good fruit, we have the need for the source of life to be beyond our own human limitations. And Jesus says, I am the true vine in your branches. And, and by living in relationship with me and me in relationship to you, then you have all this good fruit. You have the love. You have the joy. You have the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, the faith, the gentleness, the control. And then the earth is filled with the knowledge of His glory as much as the ocean is full of water. The world is filled with the intimate knowledge of God as Isaiah and Habakkuk saw those visions of the world being filled with His glory. The same thing Jesus is talking about in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know in Romans 14, 17 that the kingdom of God is described as righteousness, meaning the right way of living, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is how the kingdom comes on earth, yes. by means of the Spirit, yes. the Spirit of God's grace, enabling us to do what we don't have the power yes. in and of our Thank own selves Amen. to do. Yes. Philippians 2.13, remember Philippians 2.13, God works in us both to will and to do His good purpose. Or as a modern version says, He gives us the desires and actions that please Him. In other words, 
All of this relates to the purpose for which God created the human. And I'll just say it one more time as a way of concluding this before my opening was to say these verses. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. I'll just say them one more time, okay? Just for a review. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And Elohim says, let us make Adam the human as our image, as our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and rule over the birds of the air and rule over the livestock and rule over all the earth and rule over every creature that moves along the ground. So Elohim created Adam the human as his own image. As the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blesses them and he says to them, be fruitful and fertile and fill the earth and bring the earth under your control and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the earth and let them rule over every living creature that moves on the ground. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to say, Lord, this passage, Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, this passage is your purpose for the human race. Amen. Yes. And that means that in the Lord's Prayer, your purpose is going to be fulfilled because you say to us through the Apostle John in his first letter that when we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if we know you hear us, then we know that we have what we asked from you. And that is according to your Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 9 starts the Lord's Prayer. And it starts out with honoring your holy and set-apart name because you're God and we're not. You're the Creator that has a good purpose for us to live by means of your indwelling spirit to produce all the good fruit that projects your image to the world. But it's not I, it's the Anointed One who lives through me and through all of us in this world, Father God, according to your purpose for the human that we all project the image that is that which the human is according to Psalm 8 verse 5 the human was crowned in creation was crowned with glory and honor well Jesus you're the human and you're crowned with glory and honor but in the human nature you are one with us in sharing that nature but Jesus you depended on the spirit all the time well we depend on your spirit all the time mm -hmm. because that is the way that we can proverbially walk on the water because we can't live above the limitations of human nature on our own any more than on our own we could walk on the water but by your spirit Lord lifting us up then Lord we can do that which is otherwise not possible so Lord you're able to do according to your power at work within us by means of your spirit, releasing your life in and through us, Father, we're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. So that you get the glory and the image of God is projected from our lives. All the people on the planet are regarded as one person in the eyes of the Creator who created Adam, the human, to reflect his image. And it's going to happen, Father God, on this earth because Jesus' prayer is going to be answered in the Lord's Prayer. The kingdom will come on this earth. The will of God will be done here as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. Awesome. I've got a scripture to read. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man came in the house of heaven, came to the ancient of days, and he brought me before him, and it was given to him a denomination and glory, in a kingdom that all people, all nations, languages should serve in, Language. dominion is not left in dominion, should not pass away, and his kingdom which should not be destroyed. Interesting, real quick, in one comment on Larry's prophecy from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. What you were talking about. It is what I'm talking about, because he sees a vision in the night. Daniel sees a vision in the night, and he sees one like the Son of Man. But the Hebrew is the, well, actually, this is technically the Aramaic 
Daniel 7, 13, 14 is actually in the Aramaic language, one of those few verses in the Hebrew Bible that was written in the dialect off of Hebrew, the Aramaic. But, but in the Aramaic, one like a son of humanity. In other words, we're talking about the king that is going to be worshipped and served by all peoples and all languages and all nations. The king that's going to be worshipped is also going to be human. Who's also going to have the human body that is going to reflect the image of the Creator. And so this is going to happen that all peoples and nations and languages will worship Him and will celebrate the joy of the Lord in His kingdom that an answer to the Lord's prayer will be brought down to earth as it is in heaven. It's His promise and it's projected to us in the beginning of the Bible with God's purpose in Genesis 1, 26, the creation of the human race for the purpose that we've been reading about tonight. To rule the earth. In other words, the king rules the earth through us. I just want to give this service to the Lord. I'm going to say, God, thank you for the blessing of having my mom here. Thank you, Father God, for having my wife and daughter here. Thank you for having everybody here that means so much to me, Father God. And thank you for everyone listening through the internet as well. Lord, you're working in us exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. And you're getting the glory because we give all the credit to you because the good fruit is that which you produce in us by the spirit of your grace. The dependence is on you, our source of life, Father. Continue to live through us that in Matthew 5, 16, we may therefore let our light shine so that people will see the good stuff that comes out of our life. Yes. The good works and give praise to the source, our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.